Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're thinking. We've got to think. This is Think Tech, and we're thinking about Asia, so it's Think Tech Asia. And my old buddy Russell is back from China. Hi, Russell. Good morning. Ni hao. Ni hao to you, baby. <clears throat> so it's nice to have you here. And we have a special guest, and that is Mark Lenart. Uh, and he's with a firm that begins with, um, what, Bunker Hofstetter? Am I get that right, Mark? No, <laughs> Baker Hofstetter. B Banker Hofstetter in, in, in Washington, D.C. And guess what? They deal with trade. So that's what we're talking about, trade wars or tech wars. Will the real Donald Trump please stand up? The huge risks involved with Trump's trade policy. So, you know, before the show began, Mark, we were talking about, you know, how the normal ebb and flow of trade works and where the high points and low points are and where the, you know, the gratifications and the challenges lie. Can you, give, can you give people who, you know, I think in large part we don't, we as a population, as an electorate, don't understand trade, international trade, can you give a thumbnail for us about how trade works in the normal course? Sure. Um, you know, we have uh, 100 plus, 120 or so countries in the world that joined the World Trade Organization. It's a, it's a group that started uh, at the end of World War II and, and wanted to clear uh, the hurdles that, that sort of caused the countries to hurdle into World War II. Um, and that was uh, everybody was raising their tariffs. Um, and so this group of countries agreed to lower their tariffs and to lower barriers to trade. And, and countries focused on trading with each other and creating jobs and creating wealth rather than fighting each other. And so, you know, the way the way trade works now under the WTO is that tariffs are significantly lower um, than they were, you know, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, and everybody is supposed to treat everybody else with respect. You know, there are a couple of of um, core principles to uh, the trade world now. Um, we have, uh, you know, the tariff binding. Everyone keeps their tariffs low. Um, everyone keeps their trade barriers in just tariffs. So there are no non-tariff barriers. And they treat others as they would treat their own nationals. This is called national treatment. And they treat everybody as if they're the most favored trading, trading partner. That's most favored nation status. Um, and these are principles that have been around, uh, you know, for uh, quite a time since the GATT. And we trade with each other. Is it, is it um, a perfect world, Mark? I mean, does this system no. you described work perfectly, or are there imperfections? And if so, what are the imperfections we deal with in the normal course? Sure. Yeah, you know, there are always going to be people who abuse trade or countries that abuse trade. And, and both the GATT and the WTO agreements uh, provide for measures to counteract this abuse. Um, we have something called uh, anti-dumping duties, which are, you know, if countries are, um, you know, dumping or selling their goods at, at um, unreasonably low prices, uh, you know, below their cost of production or whatever else, trying to get into a market by underselling uh, the producers in that country. Uh, we have countervailing duties, which are intended to counteract subsidies provided by uh, by governments around the world. Uh, safeguard duties, which are intended to allow a domestic uh, industry to adjust to an increase in foreign imports. Um, and uh, then we have trade agreements that uh, that began uh, taking the world by storm a few decades ago, and. And these allow us to have closer relationships with, uh, you know, countries who are close allies or, or close trading partners. It, <clears throat> excuse me. Is it fair to say that the more trade we have globally, the better the global economy is? In other words, trade in general is a positive experience for humanity, for the species around the planet. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, you know, there are always going to be losers when people trade, right? I mean. If, uh, if you make your sunglasses uh, cheaper than I can, then people will buy your sunglasses rather than mine. You know, if you're in Washington state and you're in a rainy weather, uh, you know, you're not gonna be able to uh, do as well with the sunglasses. But overall, um, everybody wins with trade. And you know, Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of the US, he said, cultivate peace and commerce with all. Because <laughs> the, it's the commerce side. Uh, 
makes everybody happy. Yeah. So, um, you know, going into it now, I mean, you're a trade lawyer. Your firm, I guess, has a, a section or maybe it's dedicated in large part to trade. What does it mean to be a trade lawyer? Do you negotiate trading agreements between countries? No, the negotiating trade agreements is uh, from government to government. Uh, what we do is we defend foreign companies in U.S. Uh, trade actions. Uh, so this is anti-dumping uh, duty investigations or subsidy investigations, safeguard investigations that are all that are uh, conducted by the U.S. government. Um, let me ask you a question, Mark. I think I think for our audience, one of the things that is is impressive about his background is that. Uh, Mark, you, you've been a U.S. Uh, commerce lawyer. You've been on the U.S. side representing the U.S. government. And now you're representing Chinese clients. So, so your viewpoints, tell us about your viewpoints. What have you seen by working on both sides of fences and in relation to what we see today, what President Trump is doing and his administration? Because I think you, you have a very balanced view working both on the government side of the U.S. as now you work on the Chinese side. That's right. Well, I was in the government. I, I defended the U.S. actions in court and at the WTO, uh, and now I sue the U.S. government. <laughs> um, you know, the people in the government are great people, but uh, they're driven by the policies of the government. Um, and we've seen, you know, with, uh, with President Obama, for example, uh, the Democratic Party was known as the Protectionist Party for a long time until uh, Donald Trump came along. Um, and he, you know, President Obama enforced or ramped up enforcement of, of trade agreements and, and the WTO through anti-dumping and countervailing duties. Um, I would say, you know, there's a lot of discretion under the U.S. law, and I felt that uh, foreign uh, producers and U.S. importers weren't given a fair shake under the U.S. law. Uh, the Department of Commerce is supposed to be a neutral arbiter of the laws, um, and their uh, mantra for a long time was to level the playing field, but it's significantly tilted towards the U.S. industry. Um, and I'm, you know, sort of principles of fairness are what drive me, and when I left the Department of Commerce, uh, I didn't have much interest in, in representing the U.S. industry because they're so favored anyway. Um, I, I sought to to defend foreign companies and hopefully get fair results from them from the Department of Commerce. Because if results are fair, if the rule of law is followed, then it's predictable. And anyone can adjust their behavior to, um, you know, come in line with what the responsibilities are under uh, the WTO agreement. Well, in trade, uh, in mercantile <clears throat> arrangements, you need predictability. How important is predictability on a global trade basis? I think it's absolutely predictable. And the U.S., uh, what the U.S. has done with its trade law is make it as unpredictable as possible. Um, you know, the U.S. is one of the few, if not the only country, that uh, conducts its trade investigations retrospectively. So they look at what has come into the U.S. and calculate the duties after after the, the goods have already come into the U.S. With other countries, it's perspective. So at the border, you know what you're paying in, in, uh, in anti-dumping duties or, or anti-subsidy duties. Uh, the U.S. just uh, doesn't do that. They, they make it as unpredictable as possible so that it adds an extra advantage to let, the U.S. company. Let me ask this question, Mark. You know, I, I think you hit a point that's important, that maybe the rule of law that we proposed uh, to the world for many decades, um, we're changing the rules now. Um, and we hear about Section 301 challenges, 302. What, what's that about, if you could tell the audience what the U.S. is doing sure. with that and how it affects the WTO? Um, uh, where are we going to the WTO, which is supposed to be the body uh, that kind of governs all this stuff so that everybody has a fair playing field? Sure. Um well, let's start with what the WTO covers, and that is anti-dumping, countervailing duty, and, and safeguard investigations. I mentioned those earlier about, um, you know, counteracting uh, what they call predatory dumping or, or purposely underselling uh, to get market share, uh, government subsidies, and then just uh, an overwhelming amount of, of imports. Uh, Section 232 is uh, a reference to U.S. law that allows uh, the president to take action uh, to protect um, national defense requirements. 
Um, it's a law that was enacted uh, long before the WTO agreements uh, came around, and um, it, it hadn't been used in the WTO era until recently. They sort of resurrected this old law. Um, the national security duties are intended to protect the capacity of U.S. industries to meet national defense requirements. Um, it, it looks not only at what is actually needed for national defense, but also um, U.S. capacity, um, uh, the, the sectors that um, are related to uh, national defense requirements. So they're looking at the employment and the skills that the U.S. has. And, and I think that, uh, you know, my own opinion is that it's a legitimate law that any country should be able to uh, protect sort of core industries to a level that makes them comfortable with their national security. Um, there is a, a GATT exception for security uh, actions. What's interesting about it, though, is there, there are three different types of exceptions under the security exception. And I, I'm going to go from the last to the first and then the second. The last one is any action that uh, a member country has to take pursuant to obligations under the United Nations Charter, right? So if there's a coordinated uh, boycott on, you know, uh, um, services or trade from a certain country that the UN has has um, enacted or, or, or resolved, then nothing that a country does under that UN Charter uh, action is going to um, uh, create a problem with the WTO. Well, you know, one, one very important thing I think we ought to talk about, and I think this show is so important that we should not take a break, um, is, is exactly what has happened under the Trump administration. I think there are hundreds of millions of Americans who don't know what's going on. Uh, they don't know what the policy is or how the policy has changed or how that affects people, except, you know, that we have a trade war. That's, we, we do have a trade war. We are, I think, you correct me if I'm wrong, we're in the middle of a trade war. Um, but yeah. aside from that, when, what is the policy of the White House, of the national government, under these various, um, you know, laws and treaties in which the national government can make choices? Uh, how has it changed in the past, what, 18 months? Um, and th that's the first order of business. What is behind the curtain here? We get little snippets of news on the 6 o'clock news, but do we know what the White House is really doing? So can you tell us just, a, you know, in a precis, um, you know, what, how has the Trump administration changed the ordinary course of trade? What policies has it put into place? What policies has it changed, repealed, ignored, uh, to, to reach the current state of affairs? Well, you know, we'll start with Obama, and what Obama did was he ramped up enforcement, but it was all within the WTO uh, parameters. Uh, he also sought free trade agreements and, and, and sought to establish those. Uh, Donald Trump has uh, pulled out of free trade agreements, and he's sort of, you know, gone with the enforcement on steroids, resurrected old laws. Um, and I'll read a, I'll read a, a tweet that he, uh, that he sent out yesterday, uh, excuse me, two days ago on the 24th. He said, the United States is insisting that all countries that have placed artificial trade barriers and tariffs on goods going into their country remove those barriers and trade or be met with more than reciprocity by the USA. Trade must be fair and no longer a one-way street. So what we see from Trump is he doesn't see the gains that the U.S. has made and is making with trade. He only sees the losses. He, he, he plays zero-sum games where he wants to win everything. He wants the U.S. to export to everybody and not import or import a lot less. And that's just not how trade works, and it's, it's not how it works with, you know, when you're, when you're trying to deal with allies and, and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's gone to a zero-sum game when I think previous administrations have seen this as, as trying to get to a win-win situation. You know, I asked you before, and I wonder if, you, if any part of his um, policies now in trade, the things he has done since January of 2017, um, work? Are, are any of them useful or any of them defensible from a, nat a national interest or uh, a, an American industry point of view? You know, you can say yes and no, uh, to be fair. Uh, my own view is that um, it's what he's done is over the top. Uh, you know, if I were making trade policy for the U.S., I think I'd be more accommodating 
Um, but with the zero-sum approach, uh, what Donald Trump has done is take old laws and, uh, in my view, abuse them to the greatest advantage that he sees, but I think it's a short-term advantage for the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we see that already with, uh, you know, there was news yesterday about Harley-Davidson. Right? They've seen, you know, with the U.S. pushing uh, the tariffs to protect the U.S. industries, countries around the world have retaliated. So most people go to Harley-Davidson because uh, they're from Wisconsin, where uh, House Speaker uh, Paul Ryan is from. And uh, Harley-Davidson can't, can't sell its motorbikes around the world when it's dealing with 25 percent tariffs around the world, as, just as the U.S. has put up a 25 percent tariff on, on a, uh, steel and aluminum coming into the U.S. So what you see is, um, you know, the short-term gain maybe was uh, protection for the U.S. industry, but then when the retaliation comes in, the U.S. exporters can't export anymore. So Harley-Davidson moves production that's intended for Europe over to its new Thailand facility. So the U.S. loses jobs and loses that revenue. Mark, it's just what Trump wanted to avoid, the loss of jobs to overseas. So <clears throat> the net effect of his tariff on Harley-Davidson uh, you know, now, now creates a situation where Harley is going to manufacture overseas, which is perfectly opposite of what he wanted. And, and I, I got to add, exactly. I'm sorry, Mark, I, I, you know, you mentioned something that really hit the word um, capacity. You know, the president is doing things to build capacity. But I think one of the problems, uh, you know, I'm an FDI lawyer, and which is the bookend to trade. Uh, trade means a good relationship with countries. Um, American co uh, companies, for example, they need to build global supply chains. They need to go to foreign countries because labor is just too expensive in America. So do you think now, how does this affect now the trade relationship? Doesn't that affect now the ability of American companies to go elsewhere? We don't have friends uh, to uh, build that supply chain. Uh, we don't have in the U.S. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, supply chains are different than they were 30 years ago. You look at this, you know, they did the national security investigation as steel and aluminum, and now they're doing automobile. Well, that hurts American companies as much as it hurts foreign companies. You know, you've got, you've got uh, you know, BMW and Toyota and Honda are all making cars in the U.S., and, and GM and Ford are making cars overseas. Uh, so this is, it's a severe disruption, um, even if you don't go to the standpoint of uh, allies and good trade relationships. Um, it's it's destroying the the private businesses that uh, that are what make this country run. Um, and then if you step back to the you know our allies and trading partners, well, number one, nobody can rely on what the U.S. says anymore. Um, and and number two, you know, I, my hope is that countries will have a little bit of patience with the U.S. until we get over this Trump phase. And then uh, will let us back into their good graces once it's over. Well, here's a question, Mark. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. You, what you were talking, so I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but but it, it seems that China is is a player that understands a longer term viewpoint. Um, let me give you an example of what what are your thoughts. You know, we talk about the tariffs on steel and aluminum. So then Boeing has is going to have problems selling their planes outside, for example, to China. And so it's interesting that last year, in fact, Boeing is already ahead of the game. They opened up the joint venture with a, a Chinese company to do uh, finishing of the planes. And mm -hmm. what are your thoughts? Because just recently, Xi Jinping, uh, uh, America played into the line, and Xi Jinping said, we're going to remove the foreign ownership restrictions. You don't have to do joint ventures. So in other words, in the aviation manufacturing industry, now Boeing is, is probably going to make the next step, would actually move its facilities, uh, create a, their own Wufi in China, their own subsidiary, and actually that intellectual property will go to China. And, and they're going to hire Chinese workers to probably make the planes for Boeing for the Chinese market. So, so what do you think about that? The, you know, the whole idea of capacity and trade, how they, how they There's intertwine. There's really two parts to that, Mark. One is, <clears throat> you know, what, what Trump is doing, how is it affecting, how is it generating clever ideas in China and, and American industry dealing with China, um, you know, and, wh and the, wh whether those will work in the long term or work against us. And I guess the second part of the question inherently is, uh, are we going to have the same process with other countries? Is this going to affect a kind of pushback, not, not just in a tariff war, but in an industrial war? 
um, you know, a supply chain war, if you will, uh, all over the world. Yeah, well, you know, this, this goes into the uh, Section 301 action, uh, which is, you know, the U.S. brought to, uh, because they say that uh, China requires these uh, technology transfers. I, frankly, I've always looked at it as, as a business decision. You know, uh, Boeing wants to be in China. Uh, there's a huge growth market in aviation in China, and they take uh, they make some calculated risks. They know they're going to have to uh, share some technology with China, but they their risk assessment is that it's worth it. Um, but then when Donald Trump tries to step in and 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 force companies in the U.S. to deal one way or another with other countries, then it sparks some retaliation. And, China plays the long game, I think, better than everybody in the world. It has a, a much longer-term view. Um, and you've seen China try to play uh, nice with Donald Trump. But President Xi, just the other day, he said, you know, Western cultures are taught to, when, they're, when, when they get hit on one cheek, to turn the other cheek. He said, well, in China, we, we punch back. <laughs> um, but, but that's only, I think, when necessary. There's a lot of restraint. And, uh, you know, China has has um, demonstrated a lot of restraint with all of this chaos that uh, Donald Trump has created. Um, but you have seen things like, um, you know, when Donald Trump said, we're going to impose a $50 billion uh, uh, in tariffs uh, for this Section 301 intellectual property uh, transfers, uh, China said, well, we're going to retaliate with $50 billion. And then Donald Trump said, well, we'll retaliate with $200 billion. <clears throat> And uh, China said, we'll, we'll retaliate in kind. <laughs> um, and then you see some, I think, arrogance of some of the people at the top of the administration where they say, well, China can't go somewhere else for, uh, for example, soybeans, right? They buy, I think China buys about $15 billion worth of soybeans from the U.S. every year, and they just can't go somewhere else. Well, China can. Uh, and China just uh, reduced tariffs on soybeans from a number of Southeast Asian countries. And I guess I would, I would ask you, Mark, where does that all go? Let's assume that the administration and some of the arrogant people in the White House, uh, you know, keep on pushing from one number to, to the other, and, and Xi Jinping keeps on pushing. Where does that go? That would be a wall, you know, against all kinds of trade, and it would, in many ways, stop trade between the U.S. and China. And the, where, does it, where does it take us? And the question that Mark was getting to answer, and I think that you're going to ask, Jay, is, does China need the U.S.? Yeah. China can go elsewhere. In soybeans or otherwise. Does China need the U.S.? A long-term game. Does or can China, China find US? other ways to satisfy its economic trade needs? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, what we see, to answer the first part, is that, uh, you know, pushing tariffs higher and higher. And it's not just China. I mean, you know, we, we look at uh, what, what Trump is doing to Canada and Mexico, right? And especially the Canadians, these are supposed to be our friends, and, and they're being horribly mistreated by this administration. Um, you know, where does this end us? Well, if you look at a parallel in 1930, when the U.S. passed the Hawley Smoot Tariff Act, it raised tariffs uh, for countries around the world, and, um, you know, that led to the Great Depression and uh, uh, some extremist leaders around the world in World War II. Uh, I really hope we don't even get close to there. But we're looking at China and the U.S., who are, you know, the biggest trading partners, I think, of each other. China certainly is of the U.S. Um, and, um, you know, Canada and Mexico are two and three. Uh, so, you know, th this, doesn't, this path doesn't end well for anybody. Um, and the second part of the question, what can China do? Uh, you know, I think China, to some extent, needs the U.S., but certainly not at the level that it's engaged right now. Um, China has developed trade relations around Southeast Asia, uh, is currently uh, redoubling efforts with uh, the EU. There are markets around the world that I think are sufficient for uh, Chinese demand, uh, excuse me, Chinese products, and, and uh, you know, it can reduce what it buys from the U.S. It can buy from other places. Um, what I see possible see is that is that uh, China might deal with um, countries, say, in Europe that were formerly our trading partner allies and who we have, who Trump has, has alienated. Same thing with Canada or Mexico. Uh, and so Absolutely. the result is we get cut out, we get isolated, and that's got to have a huge effect on our economy, no? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you see this happen uh, over, over the world's history as, um, you know, these 
uh, empires have lost their export markets, right? I mean, you look at the um, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, British Empire; it, was, it lost its export markets and slowly uh, dwindled down to where it is still a, a strong country, but nowhere near where it was. Um, you know, the Austria-Hungarian Empire, and you know, you see every every empire that's risen around the U.S. or excuse me, around the world. Uh, later in its history, it uh, it loses its connections and its allies and its trading partners, and that's when it begins to fade. And that's if U.S. policy doesn't change, uh, you know, in the near future, then that's where the U.S. is heading as well. You know, well, even if China finds a way to deal without the U.S., um, do you, do you, would you still say that's going to affect the global economy? You know, I mean, absolutely. It's. What, what the U.S. has done, because the U.S. has a huge market. I mean, it's, we are about 350 million people, and we have a lot of money, and we buy a lot of things. It's a very consumer-oriented uh, uh, market. And everyone likes to sell in the U.S. because we pay uh, good prices for things. Um, as we shut off our market, then uh, the industries in all of those countries are going to have to sell somewhere. And if they don't have the big U.S. market, then their industries are going to shrink as well, unless they can find somewhere else to sell. The EU is the, the next logical place with about 450 million people and fairly wealthy nations. But outside of the U.S. and the EU, you have uh, billions of people, but not as much wealth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the U.S. closing its borders has a significant effect around the world. Well, I, I think I add something to that, Mark, and, and you can tell me what your thoughts on it. And what I see is that um, being in China, I just got back here two days ago. Um, the mood is changing in China. Um, you know, we have tons of Chinese students that go to the U.S., pursue graduate law degrees, business, and, and now they're starting to rethink that America is not friendly. We're going to go to Europe. You know, it changes the, the whole mindset. It changes the mindset that uh, America is not our friends and, you know, we need to pay more attention to Europe and Africa. And, you know, that's where I see the danger is that America is falling out, period. Um, we're, we're seeing right. the influence. Um, it's going to go to these other parts of the world. And in fact, the Chinese are going to woo in more European investments into China and more trade with Europe. And, and yeah. China is going to pick up that slack. What do you think? Well, I think you're right. It's, it's actually it's a more effective retaliation. Uh, if you raise tariffs, that means your own people are paying more for goods. Uh, so you're burdening your own people. Whenever Donald Trump raises tariffs here, He's making Americans pay more for the same goods, and and the more that they're paying is just going to the U.S. coffers, to the government coffers. Um, you know, when China moves its purchases to other countries, um, you know, it has a, a significant relationship with Australia for natural resources, and it, it, it buys a lot of coal and, and uh, oil and gas from the U.S., but, you know, there are plenty of places around the world. Those relationships will strengthen. Um, I think uh, countries around the world will have uh, a warmer relationship with China because of the trade relations, and uh, the U.S. will begin to fade. And it'll really, it's going to really hurt the U.S. if it doesn't change its trade policies very well, quickly. I, I worry about something you said a little while ago, and that is the, the rise of dictators in Europe um, was a result, at least in, in part, of the Smoot-Hawley uh, uh, tariff bill in 1930. <clears throat> and uh, that that same process could happen today. Um, what I'm what I'm asking you really is whether there's a linkage between all of this, between you know the trade war, uh, the isolation, uh, the economic recession or depression, uh, the um, emergence of leaders uh, that is uh, you know tyrannical leaders, and and also um, enmity between countries. It converts to. Diplomatic relations doesn't it undermines the relation the relationships of the country in general such as what Trump was doing by insulting leaders at the G8 and insulting Canada and Mexico um, that has a long-term effect on our uh, relations in general beyond economic doesn't it absolutely uh, you know it's uh, I think it's an old saying that everybody's happy when everyone's making money but when things start getting tight then you find out who your true friends are. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we hope that uh, that the damage that uh, Donald Trump is doing with our international standing uh, can be overlooked and reversed. But, you know, it, it's tough because countries look at the U.S. and they see Donald Trump and they say, this is the one who the citizens of the U.S. elected. 
so he's a reflection of the United States. That's not a perception that changes easily. Mm, yeah. Um, and, you know, in terms of the connection between trade and, and eventual, um, you know, despotic leaders, uh, I think there's a direct connection. You get protectionism, which looks good for a quarter or two. It's a short-term gain. And then things turn uh, difficult for the, the domestic industry. Uh, it loses its export markets. Uh, which means it lays off workers. And then there are fewer people and fewer or less wealth in the U.S. to buy their products, so they lay off more workers. And then you have a large number of people who don't have work. And that's where the problem is. They want to blame somebody. And some, you know, dynamic leader will rise up and say, it's their fault. And all of those people who are looking for someone to blame will cling to that. And I think it's something that you already see. You see with Donald Trump. Um, he tapped into a nerve in the Midwest where people were out of work because manufacturing jobs had gone away, and they were looking for someone to blame. And uh, whether they said it or didn't say it, when Donald Trump did say it, somebody who they knew as a billionaire and a TV personality, they clung on to that. And, uh, you know, you see in his, his supporters are as supporting of him now as they were uh, a year and a half ago. Um, you see similar rises happening in European countries, um, uh, where you have leaders that are, you know, described as far right and nationalists and et cetera in a few European countries. Um, I'd say things are happening like that in Latin America, although the Latin America has a long history of it. But um, you know, you see uh, what's happening in Venezuela, and that's you know a country that. Uh, is a is a beautiful country that I've been to, and and in the last 15 years, it's really it's lost lost the beauty that it had, and and um, a lot of it is you know what, what happened in Venezuela is you can see uh, you know a model for what's happening in the U.S. Venezuela and the U.S. were uh, close allies, um, and then uh, you had Hugo Chavez come up uh, into power, and he um, began you know insulting the U.S., damaging the relationship with the U.S. Uh, he then reached out to countries that were not traditional allies of the United States, right? Russia, the Middle East, and China. Um, and, and then, you know, they began to suspend uh, free speech and a free press, and uh, the, political, the political arena became less free, and then there were price controls, and, and everything spiraled out of control. And this is not a happy well story. Is. It, it stays it's not a happy story, and, uh, and I think we have to follow it. And it's not as simple as just reversing what Trump did. We have, we have damage to control and prevent against. We have fences to mend, fences to mend, which is why I want to suggest, Mark, that we do more with you. I hope we can call you back and explore these issues in even greater detail and, next time around. And better yet, Mark said he's going to get on a plane and he's going to come out here and we're going to do it live. <laughs> well, that'd be great, Mark. Absolutely. A little bit of surf and a little bit of talk. <laughs> All right. Mark, okay. Mark Lenhardt in Washington, D.C., a trade lawyer. We greatly appreciate your participation on Think Tech. Look forward to more of it. Thank you, Mark, and see you in Beijing next time. Thank you, Russell. Thank you. Thank you.